Hi guys, welcome to another Word Electronics Repair video. This video was sponsored by PCBWay and if you've been watching my channel recently you'll know I've been building a number of projects using circuit boards from PCBWay and we've had quite a lot of fun building this stuff. But today I thought we'd do something a bit different. So I thought I'd have a look at the possibility of building a cheap ESR meter. I made a video, all you need to know about ESR meters to fix stuff, and in that video I proved there was lots and lots of uses to the ESR meter, not only to test capacitors, but also to measure inductors, and I was using it to find short circuit MOSFETs in VRMs, would you believe? So I link that video from this one, but in the meantime, let's nip over to PCBWay's website and I want to show you a project they have on there. This is the PCBWay website. So here you can upload your own designs for PCBs and you can get them manufactured at very, very good prices, very fast service. So that is one of the possibilities we have here. But PCBWay also have a shared project section. This is where people upload their own projects and you can buy the PCBs or even the fully assembled project yourself and the author will get a commission from all PCBs sold. I thought at first I'll have a look in the shared project section to see if I can find an ESR meter project. So we'll go into the project section and we have a search option. So let's go into the search and have a look if we can find what we want. And we will just simply search for ESR meter. What do we have? Well, we have ESR meter with five transistors and we have another one here, ESR meter version three. So let's have a quick look at them. This is the five transistor version. And you see, basically, he's modifying a analog meter to create an ESR meter. Now we can have a look at this project, not a problem, he has videos on YouTube, but let's take a look at the other project, so that is this one, ESR meter version 3. Now once again this is a similar project. We have the PCB on here, which we can order from PCBWay, and he says that the component values are marked on the PCB. But what I don't have here is a schematic. I've tried to download the files. There's a Google Drive download link here. I've downloaded the files, which are basically what we see here. So I have the PCB layout. I can actually see the values of all the resistors. I could if I really wanted to work out the schematic from that. So I'll just order some PCBs. But I thought, you know, none of these look particularly amazing to me. So... What about building our own ESR meter? What about making our own, hopefully to use with a digital multimeter? And then once we've done that, we can actually design the PCB, upload it as a shared project, the Word Electronics Repair ESR meter, and the channel can earn a little bit of commission, yeah. So that's the first thought I had, and I had a look around. I found a number of designs, and mostly they're using analog meters or you have to perform some sort of calculations, create like a graph to calibrate the meter or to put a scale like you were seeing on those photographs on the meter. The simplest one I can find is this one. So I found this circuit on this website, but the circuit is not their design. This comes from an amateur radio magazine from around about 2008. So that's the origin of the circuit. I didn't design this. But I'm thinking of modifying this circuit. So the way this works, I'll just explain it to you. This transistor, together with this coil and these capacitors, form an oscillator. So this is an oscillator. Okay. The capacitor we are testing 
goes from here, which effectively is this end of the capacitor C1 to ground. This oscillator will effectively only oscillate if this resistance is very low. So we can put our capacitor in here, which will pass AC and act as a low resistance. Because the capacitor we are testing is much larger in value, typically ESR, we're measuring electrolytics of tens or hundreds or thousands of microfarads. So the value of the capacitor is much higher than the value of the capacitors in the oscillator. And because of that, it doesn't really affect the frequency of the oscillation. But what does happen, as the resistance increases of the capacitor, the ESR, equivalent serial resistance, the oscillation becomes lower and lower. And then after it reaches a certain point into the tens of ohms, the oscillator will stop. So from that, basically, the higher the ESR, the lower the amplitude of the oscillator, and eventually it'll stop. The other transistor, this one, effectively rectifies the oscillations on the emitter. So it rectifies the waveform and produces a DC voltage. That turns the transistor on, and the transistor draws current through the meter, which is an analog meter they're using, and the meter will deflect. So the main thing with this circuit, which I'm going to build, is that as the ESR gets lower towards zero, the meter reads higher. And as the ESR gets higher, the meter reads lower. And that's really the opposite of what I want to do. So just looking at it, one thing that occurred to me, we could try this. If we just take this meter out of circuit, so we just have the resistor, 100 ohms, because this will be an extremely low value resistance. So we just have the 100 ohm resistor here. As the ESR decreases and the oscillation gets bigger, giving a higher rectified voltage, we should actually see the voltage on the emit collector sorry, decrease. So we should actually see the lower the ESR, the lower the voltage here. If we measure on a, a millivolt meter, and the higher the ESR, the higher the voltage here. And if we can get it to do that, I don't see any reason why we can't use an op-amp circuit, maybe, to effectively do a little bit of maths for us, so that effectively one ohm is the same as one millivolt, or something like that. Okay? But first, let's build this circuit. Let's make it as it's designed. I'll try, I have an analog meter, and I'm also going to try with a digital meter in here, because in, if I put it into milliamps range or microamps range, effectively, it's zero ohms, and we should be able to get the reading on that, yeah. So let's try it first. I mean, this is an extremely simple circuit. I have some of these BC547B transistors. They are poles, uh, 51K, 100 ohm, 2.2K, 100 ohm resistor. So we have four resistors, a variable resistor, a couple of electrolytics, and then three capacitors. So it's very simple. The inductor reading the instructions, they were telling you to wind this inductor yourself. And they gave you so many turns on a certain form or of a certain thickness of wire. But to me, that's far too much hassle for our purposes. The inductor is actually a 2.5 milli Henry inductor once you've wound your own coil. But I want to use one off the shelf because it's just easier, yeah? So I have a little pack of inductors here, which I bought for building other projects, very cheaply from AliExpress. And these are micro -enries, and I want milli -enries, two and a half, yeah? And the highest value I have in here is one milli -enry. But we can get our 2.5 milli -enries because inductors are like resistors if you wire them in series. If you put 200 ohm resistors in series, you get 200 ohms. And the same applies with these. So if we put two 
one milli henry inductors in the series, we will get two milli henrys. And if we also put a four seventy micro henrys in series as well, we'll end up with two point four seven milli henrys, which is extremely close to the two point five. So that's how I'm going to do the inductor. These diodes, the only purpose of these diodes is to discharge the capacitor to prevent any damage to the tester. They have nothing to do with the measurement. They're using these 1N914. I don't have any. They're fast switching diodes. They are 100 volt, 75 milliamps. I have some 1N4148, which is another fast switching diode which are a lower voltage 75 but the 200 milliamps so i'm going to put those in for now i don't believe it's critical i can always order some of these but the first thing i want to do is to test this so we're going to build this on a bit of strip board see if it works and then we can have a play around some experiments with this i'm explaining about using the millivoltmeter to see if we can make it more like we want to and then we can take it from there we can hopefully try to as I say, add some op-amp circuit to calibrate it as we wish. And then we can make the PCBs and you can order your cheap, and I think they will be cheap, the SR meters. Okay, I have all the parts together. So there's the four diodes. I'm using four, one N4148. Um, these are 200 nanofarads or 0.1 microfarad capacitors. They, they are poles. But we could just test them with the capacitance meter. In fact, let's just do that now while we're going. Always worth testing salvage components before you use them. So we just check these. And there. Of course, the light's gone out. There you go. 100 nanofarads. 100 nanofarads. So we have those two we have the three inductors i'm going to put in series two times one milli henry and one 0.47 milli henry's so we have those um this is the 3.3 nanofarads capacitor i have a 2.2k red 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 i have two 100 ohm resistors which are the four stripe color code so it is brown for one zeros black black for zero zero then another black for no more zeros afterwards and one percent so those are brown black 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 which is 100 two of those i don't have a 51k resistor i have some 56k and some 47 but not 51 but what i do have is some 33k orange 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 three three and three zeros and i also have some 18k as well so if i put a 33k and an 18k in series i will have exactly 51 so that's those the 10 microfarad capacitors i'm using 16 volt ones is what i have the new ones the battery supply for this is only 1.5 volts anyway. This is a very low voltage tester. So we have those. I can only find one, uh, one meg resistor in my stash of stuff. And it says here will win. Hey, so I think that's a linear one, which is what we want. So the resistance varies evenly across the scale. But we can kind of prove that. So if we measure across the track, we should have one mega ohm to start with. Okay, let's get the meter and we'll find out. So I'll put it on to resistance range, okay? So the whole track from one end to the other of the potentiometer should read one meg. Okay, let's have a look. One end to the other. It's really 1.7k, but I think that's because I have these two pins connected together, which is not what I want. Well, it is actually what I want if you look at the diagram, but I want to test the thing. So let's just disconnect the 
two pins for now. Okay. So now if I read across the whole resistance from one end to the other, I should have one meg. Yeah, it's about 1.16 mega ohms. Yeah, you can see the scale now. That's close enough. If I measure to the centre, one end should read 1.1 meg, the full amount, and the other one, because this thing is set to this end, should read zero. So we go from the middle pin. Yeah, go from the middle pin a bit fiddly to do one-handed. We go from the middle pin to here, and it reads well. It reads low. Yeah, one kilogram. It might not be all the way to the end. I'll just try it again, and let's make sure we get a better contact on it. Okay. So from the middle to here. It reads, it's close, yeah, 500 ohms. Let's go to the other end, okay? So from the middle to the other end now, should read zero or near enough. Yeah, 100 ohms. And from the middle to this end, should read one meg. So we know it's working, yeah? If we now set it to halfway, so I'll just try and find halfway is there, you'd expect if it's a linear one to have 500k, from the wiper to both ends. Let's have a look. So to this end, 576, it's close, yeah. And obviously it's going to be close to the other end as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean obviously I don't have it exactly in the middle. So that's a linear one. If you read around half, the reading at the halfway position. So that's what we want. The other thing then are the transistors BC547B. Now I have some poles in here, BC547. I don't think these are in any way critical. I'm sure we could use lots of other transistors. They're 50 volts, 100 milliamp transistors. Okay. Let's see. First of all, we're heading off and actually marked B. And let's make sure we have a couple of good ones. I'll just zoom down so we can see the markings properly. Okay, here's our transistors. What do we have? What's a 547A? Can you see it? That's an A. Uh, what else do we have? That's also an A. I think the difference between the A and B is the gain this one well, it's not marked on there this is marked on the top and this is also an A this one it looks like the O A what else we got that's a B that is a 547B yeah so we've got one there we're lucky we have two of them. Yeah, we're lucky, Luke. There's another one. What's this last one with very short legs? That's an A. So I've got two of the B. As I say, I think the difference is probably the amount of gain. We can have a look, actually. So let's just get our transistor tester and let's see. Let's check our transistors. Are they both good? Yeah. Well, it's a good one. Okay. Gain is 35. That's not high. Let's look at the other one. Ah, gain is much higher. 324. That's more like it, yeah. Are any of the A's really similar to that? Let's have a look. Two hundred and twelve. What I'll probably do is just nip through all these A ones and just even find the one with the highest gain, and we'll use that with the B that's reading high. One hundred and fifty-six. 
So we'll use the one that we had 212, which is one of the A's. That's the next best one we've got. And let's just have a quick look at the data sheet just to see if that actually is what the A and B mean. Yeah, you can see here that the A is the lowest gain, the B is the middle, and the C is the highest. One of our A's is almost as good as the C, so I'm happy with that. We'll just, we'll just use that. It is a bit lower than we see there. What I will do is put the B in this position, which is the oscillator. That is, I am sure, is the more critical of them. This is just rectifying the voltage. And as I described, we may end up not actually using this. We may end up just measuring the voltage across here. But we can try. Yeah, we'll have a look. So we'll put the B in there. Right, let's start putting it together. There are a number of ways to do this. I'm not going to try and make it too small because we're going to be working on this probably and varying it. I could build it on breadboard, but I find because of the likelihood of having bad connections, I'd probably just rather use Vero board and they're all very cheap components, so it's not like there's a lot of money involved with these parts. This line here, we'll use this as ground. This can be the supply rail. So... First of all, we need to put these diodes in. So we have two diodes with the cathode facing upwards, the anode to ground. So we can put one in there. This one can go in here. Next to it, so that's those two. I can solder these now. And now we know where our test probes are going to go. One's going to go here and one's going to go here. So there's a bit of space at the end to fit some terminal strips so we can just connect onto them easily. So let's put these diodes. I usually find it's better to bend them outwards a little bit. But we can kind of straighten them as we solder them out. So I'll just put the soldering iron on. Okay, we up to temperature. We can solder these. Normally with this sort of strip board you don't need to use flux to be honest unless it's old and tarnished. This is fairly new stuff so it should go just fine. And of course there's one more. So there are our first diodes. Right, let's work our way along. So we've got two more diodes the other way round. And the middle point we can use here, but we don't want them to be shorted, so we need to cut the track here, okay? Uh, I find the easiest way to cut tracks is to use one of these. So it has like a slanted blade, and I actually believe they are designed for cutting these tracks. So you stick the hole into there, yeah, and you just twist it round. I could get this a little bit closer. Yeah, let's put it. Let's put it next to it, and then you can just literally twist it. Yeah. Okay. And that cuts the track. I and mean, it's always worth just checking with a uh, magnifier. Yeah, that is chopped. So, two more diodes, and these have the opposite polarity. Okay, so that's the other two diodes, and we have the cut track where we want it. Solder these in. Okay, so that's the diodes done. That's the first bit. Now we can fit these inductors and capacitors. So we'll do that. We'll just keep working along like this. This is probably the best way with this type of circuit. If it has integrated circuits, sometimes it's best to start with the chips. It just depends. So, capacitor. Trying to figure out which is the best uh, hole to put it in. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Okay, so there is the capacitor, 0.1 microfarads, and then the other capacitor comes down to the inductor back to ground. So 
We can stick that capacitor, I think, here, okay, and then we can cut the track before the diodes, okay, so we can cut the track effectively here, okay, so let's do that. So I'll just solder this one end first. And then I'll just cut the track. Okay, quick look down the magnifier, that is cut. So this end of this capacitor, which is being cut from the point there, okay, this is where our inductor goes to ground. Now, as I stated, we're going to have to use three inductors in series. I think the easy way, probably, is just to solder the first inductor in. Uh, solder the second one, put one across between them basically, I think that's probably just as good as any. Let me, let me see how I'm going to do this. Could actually do it like that to be quite honest. Yeah, uh, means less tracks to cut, that's for sure. So as you see, really I'm just building on the board what I see on the paper, okay? I'm building what I can see basically. So we have those two, and then we have one more inductor, which is going to just solder directly across them. And I think that's the easiest way to do with a three in series. Okay. Yeah. I've just realised actually this paper is actually making this harder to. See this, I think it's affecting the camera. Uh, a bit better, I think. Yeah, that's a bit better, I think. Let's do it carried on like this, yeah, so you can see a bit better what I'm doing. So we can take that off. We can take this off. And then this can just fold back around here. Okay. And we have our three inductors, which adds up to the 2.5 millihenries. So we've got as far as this, yeah. So now we need the capacitor to go to the base of our transistor. So where are we going to put that? I propose that we're going to put it a little bit higher up on the track, a little bit further up. Oh, it's bad. I'm just trying to figure out which way. So one end of the transistor is going to go down to ground. Yeah, we probably better put it actually this way. If we come down a little bit, then we can easier get this transistor in. Just making sure we've got enough space for the other resistor to go to ground. I mean, I can obviously put it in vertically between two pins. Let me just have a look at the other way around. You know, I think that'll actually be easier to fit if we go that way. Okay. So there we go, there's nothing on this track. We can just make sure we haven't got a short or anything silly here, it's worth doing when you've been working on the board. Okay, ohms range. No, there's no short there. Just check the meter's working, yes. Yeah, we're fine. Okay, so we've now got our capacitor. So this goes into the base of our first transistor. Yeah. And this we're going to use the B. 
So here is our 548B. I'm sure I could look up the data sheet to see which way around they go. In fact, I believe I have a drawing of it here anyway. Emitter, base collector. But it's just as easy actually just to check with the component analyzer to be sure. So green should be base, which is in the middle, and then we'll make sure we know which is the emitter and collector. Okay, red is the emitter, so this end, this is the flat side, and this end is the emitter. So our transistor, which looks like my diagram by the way, our transistor goes in like this, with the emitter towards ground. Okay, let's just tidy the solder up a little bit and we can do it. So we go this way round with the emitter towards ground, yeah. Move it out of the way a minute so you can see it. So this top end of the capacitor, which is on the track which isn't going to anything, that goes to the base. So base goes there. Then we have one track in between the legs of the capacitor, which is where we can put the emitter. I'm going to put it a bit further away across here because I need the space to attach this, okay? So I'm not going to go close up to the capacitor, I'm going to come a little bit further away. Base emitter, collector, I think that will do it just nicely. Yeah, in there. If I've done it right and I have, the middle pin, which is the base, will be on the same line as here, this is where the capacitor is. Glasses keep slipping down my nose today. All this leaning forward. Uh. Okay. So there is our transistor. Right, back to the diagram. So the emitter goes to the base of this transistor and it also goes to ground via the 2.2K. So the 2.2K is the red, red, red. And this is going to go from our emitter all the way down to ground. So there's our resistor to ground. Again, I'm just following what I see. Okay. Rather than bending them like this, in which case they're more likely to short to the next track, bend them like that. Okay if you're going to bend them at all. That end soldered and I'm going to straighten this one up. And that's soldered. Chop those off. Okay. What else do we have here? Well, let's put these resistors in first and then we can come and sort this connection out, yeah? So from the collector to our power rail, which um, I said I was going to put at the top. I think I still will actually. This is where we put the 100 ohm resistor, or one of the 100 ohm resistors. This is one of the 100 ohms. Okay, so this can go from our collector up to the top. And then we have plenty of space for this. That's our collector resistor fitted. Cut the legs off. So now we've got the 51K and the one meg resistor. To be quite honest, it doesn't matter which way round these two go. It's the same thing. But I'm going to put it that way round. Okay. So the 51K I didn't have. But I have a 33k. I'm just checking there's enough space on the board. Let's have a look. Move this out of the way again. You can see it a bit easier. So the 33k can go to there. And then we have the 18k. I just realised I'd actually grabbed a 12 and not an 18. 
so I know that the right one yeah that will fit in there nicely and then there's a space to connect our potentiometer okay let's do it so this one can go like so need to go one hole more okay this one then can go actually wants to be one hole less i'm going to put this upright yeah that's how i'm going to do it oh, that's that fitted so now from the end of the 18k to the base is where our variable resistor goes so i'm going to fit um, a little pin header in here and then we can just attach some wires easily so let's get a little bit of a pin header i can use three pins that's just the right amount so the middle one actually will not be connected to anything i can leave it in there but won't have to be connected to anything yep it's correct so the middle pin is actually connecting to the collector of the transistor but we don't need to attach anything to there i don't think but we're going to experiment with this, you know, so who knows what might happen, okay. These are a bit fiddly because you have to hold the thing in place while you try to get some solder to it. Try like this. Pick up a bit of solder on the iron. Do not put your finger on the same pin that you're trying to solder because you will notice very rapidly that was not a good idea. Yeah. You really need three hands for this. Let me try and get some solder. Okay, I've got some solder on the bit. Once I get one pin to stick down, then you're fine. You can then come and sort it out. So I've got one pin stuck. It's not soldered very well, but the thing won't fall out now. The pin header is basically vertical. It's close enough leading slightly just try and straighten it a little bit okay right you can now solder all the pins that will stay in the board that one that one and back to the one that wasn't very good okay so we have our pin header on there. I'll just check for shorts. That looks good visibly. So this is where we attach our potentiometer. Right, so we've done all that. So the only thing we haven't done now is this connection from here to here. So this is the top of the two capacitors goes to the emitter. Okay. Well, we can do that with actually a little wire jumper, but I've just noticed we need to cut a track because this here is the pin header, which is the collector of our transistor. And at the moment, we have a short from here to here. So we need to just fix that. This is the most important thing about doing this sort of work is watching out for short circuits as you work your way across. So now I've got rid of the short, we can take one piece of wire from here and the other end can go to the emitter of our transistor. Let me find a little bit of wire. So we now have our wire link in there. Okay, and that's going from the junction of these two capacitors to the emitter of Q1, the 547B. I'm now going to put the other transistor in. So we are getting there now. If you look at the circuit, we only have this bit to build. So the base of this one goes to the resistor, which is here. I'm going to put it a bit further across. We have a bit of space. The emitter goes to ground. So I'll probably have to put a jumper in to do that. And then we have the 100 ohm and the position for our meter. Okay, I'm going to mount the transistor down here. It's quite handy because the emitter is connecting directly to ground, which is what we want. The base, we can put one wire jumper to the other end of this resistor. And then the collector we can fit here. We have plenty of room to put the resistor and the connections to the ammeter. Now, 
The other advantage of this is if you look where the transistor now is, and I will just solder it in place so you can see. The emitter is here, which is ground. This is the base on the track which isn't being used for anything else. And this is the collector on the track which isn't being used for anything else. So we don't need to bother about cutting any tracks. Okay, we just need to put a few wire links in. Well, one wire link actually. And then the resistor and the meter. So, base goes to the other end of this resistor. That's quite easy. It's fine. And then it's just the 100 ohm resistor, the remaining one, the meter and the capacitors. That's it. So we're in one of the spare ones here. This ends going to the collector. We have that. And then we can put the jumper pins in again for the connections to the meter. Okay. That can go there. That's actually stayed in. I don't think it's going to fall out. Let's try and solder it. Before it does, yeah. <sighs> Let's try and solder it before it does. No, we've got it. We've actually got it. It's sitting flat. Middle pin again won't be used. I'll just solder it. Who knows? Mm. That can go there. And also, we can actually put uh, some sort of jumper on this. If I connect the middle pin and the end one together then we can actually fit a jumper on it if we want to try this with just the resistor and measuring voltage so i think i will actually do that the easiest way is just to put a wire link in well the easiest way is just to put a blob of solder on but that's a bit heath robinson yeah a bit messy let's do it this way so we'll connect these two pins together okay of course the easier way would have been to put this resistor like one hole further up but never mind we're kind of inventing this as we go along as we know okay so I can go there I'm just sort of thinking out loud as I go along yeah and that one up straight. Okay. Chop those off. Right. So we have that. And then lastly, we have our two capacitors. Yeah. They have nice long legs on them. The longer one is a positive it's more negative there anyway so one of them goes from the transistor we just fitted this end of the 100 ohms to ground well that's quite easy because the capacitor is near to ground anyway so you can see from the diagram the 100 ohm resistor is here on the collector so this capacitor can just go there next to the transistor okay i've actually moved along one hole just so it sits a little bit better and we've got space to get in with our meter if we want to measure things around here okay that goes there it's slightly uneven i'm sure i can just uh, straighten it up a little bit just gonna feel like it okay as a prototype, but let's try and keep it a bit tidy at least. I can't really put anything off there. I'll put the other capacitor from ground down here. Try and find some track which we're not using. I can always cut the track, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I can put that one there also next to the first one I can cut the track here and then I can again put a jumper on here and I've got the connections to the power I need to just take one wire from up here down to the capacitor so let's just do that okay it looks good I'll just use the magnifier 
Yeah, that's fine. We need to connect one wire from the positive, which is either of these pins, I've pitched them together, down to our capacitor, and then we can put a jumper down here. Okay, it's ready now to test. So I fitted some bits of terminal strip on so I can actually make the connections I want. So these are the power connections. They're just both connected together, actually. The reason I use two pins rather than one pin is because it's easier to hold this edge while you solder the other bit without it falling out of the board and without burning your finger. So that's why I use two rather than one. I have lots of uh, bits of wire like this, which I took from scrap ATX computer cases, and these are just ideal. So it's always worth salvaging these if you've got any scrap ATX cases, which I have quite a lot because I usually buy computers to salvage the parts from to sell. So those can go on there, ground and 1.5 volts. I'm going to run this off my bench power supply initially. And this again is just off a of scrap ATX, two wires. So this is where we put our capacitor under test. It goes on here, it just uses the two outer connections, otherwise not actually connected to anything. I have my one meg potentiometer, again soldered on a scrap one of these this time, just cut in half. So this can go from the outer pins of these. The middle one's actually not used. So that is my potentiometer. And then we have the connections from a test meter. So again, we can use one of these type of leads. Yeah. And we can put our test meter on here. So we can either connect the milliamp meter to here, or we can just put a jumper and then we can use a millivolts to measure the voltage across the resistor. I'm interested to see if we can get this working so we get a higher reading when we have the highest ESR. Okay, so strip a couple of wires here and we are basically ready to go with this. Okay, I have it connected, ready to go. Let's see what happens. So I have the lead shorted together at the moment. Let's power it up. Yeah, and it's passing like 200 microamps, 2 milliamps basically. So what happens if we adjust this? Oh, actually, it's a little bit... Just, just moving now seems to make quite a difference. Oh yeah, and moving that as well. It looks like it's picking up some sort of interference from the mat, I think. Uh, can I actually adjust it? Let's have a go. Well, it looks like I may have a dodgy connection in this, actually. Let's just try it. Yeah, I can adjust it. Okay. I can adjust it. It's very sensitive. And this old potentiometer, yeah, I'm just pushing on it and it's having an effect. Is that me touching the desk? Oh, yeah, look at that. Okay, so it's picking up some sort of interference from me, basically. I'll try, let's... This is my mouse mat. Let's just try this. So, who's on the mouse mat? Off the bench. Now what happens? Oh, well, that seems to have stopped it. So, it's actually my ESD mat that's causing it to do it. Plus, it looks like I have a dodgy connection in this as well. You see, I'm just moving that. Yeah, and this is the only one I had. I'm sure those are connected. Again, just touching it as a slight effect. So it looks like this needs to go into some sort of screened casing, basically. Yeah, and I've got a problem with this, definitely, Luke. So my old potentiometer is not very good. But I can get one. Or we can try putting a trimmer on there, one meg trimmer. Yeah, this is not really usable as it stands. Let's try and set it. I've ordered some multi-turn pots and multi-turn trimmers, so we can do that. Anyway, I have it at 125. Unstable. What happens if I open these wires? So it should go to zero. Yeah, it does, basically. As near as damn it. Connect them together. 
and we have this instability problem. I'll try fitting a little uh, trimmer pot on here instead of this and see if that helps. I've decided to do a couple of things here that may help as well as fitting the trimmer pot, yeah? But part of it involves that. So we have the two transistors and effectively whatever signals on the base is amplified and the same on this one. So when I built this, I just made sure that the base was on a separate track, if you like, to everything else. But the tracks are long, so if you look at this transistor, which is here, we have a base collector emitter. Yeah, and here, I'll just make sure they're the right ones. Yeah, it looks like it. Where this hole is here that's already been cut, that is in the collector. I'll fit the trimmer pot, so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put them down here, we have a bit of space, this is why I use the big board. I have a 10k and I have a 1 meg. Yeah, so 105 is 1 meg, 1 0 and 5 zeros, and the other one is 10k, 1 0 and 3 zeros. So I'm actually going to put both of these in series, effectively then on our circuit here. We will have this, so this is the transistor. Okay, and from the base, we will have the two resistors in series. Sorry, that went off the page, you can see it now, yeah? So from the base then, we will have the first one, which is the one meg. Then we will have the 10K. Okay. And then the 51K. The reason of this 51K, by the way, is so that if you effectively set this to zero, you will not just short the base to the power rail. That sets the minimum resistance at 51K. So by doing this, effectively, this will now be the course adjustment and this will be the fine adjustment so i can set it roughly within one meg and then this is a 10k so it gives you like a hundred times more sensitivity on this one so that's how we'll do that the other thing i'm going to do because of this pickup of interference the transistors you have the signal on the base which is amplified by the transistor and whatever signals on the base of here is amplified by this one. And then that effectively feeds into the next one. Yeah. So this feeds an amplified signal from here into here. And then this is amplified again by this one. So you get two stages of amplification. Now, where the base is connected to the strip board, I made sure it wasn't short into anything. But you have long copper strips on the board connecting to the bases, basically, you know, like the length of the strip. And I think that might be where the interference is coming from. So, the first transistor is here. Emit it. This is the base. Okay. And it obviously connects to there, but after that it doesn't go anywhere. So I'm going to cut the track here. Yeah, in fact, I may well cut it twice. Just make sure I definitely get it some sort of isolation yeah and in fact i may cut the track to either side as well actually to try and stop stray interference getting to here and the same on the other side of the transistor so again here i will cut the track so that will give us i'll do it properly i haven't done it properly at the moment but i'll do it properly but i'm showing you that's basically what i'm going to do yeah so i'll cut those there to kind of ensure that the base is only connected this bit of track and then the other transistor 
here again the base is the second pin up which is this track so again I'll cut this track here and here and because it's operating at quite high frequencies I'll cut this as well yeah I'll try to remove that piece of track there as well okay so let me do that fit the trimmer pots now let's see if it works better okay so I have it powered back up I've now realized that previously I was setting this to 100 which is 100 microamps it should be 1000 but this will go to 999.9 .9. so let's try and set it to that and that'll be a milliamp okay so we'll just short the two test leads together and then let's see if we can set this so this is the course adjustment okay that's gone over I'll turn the fine adjustment down to the minimum let's see if we can set this so we've got a reading it's very sensitive you can see yeah it's almost impossible to get it close on this one so really this design needs a multi-turn potentiometer that's for sure a bit more see it's gone straight over the top okay that seems to be the best i can get and then let's see how much adjustment we have on this one notice it changes i think that's because this is a metal tool as i'm coming close to it with yeah, just by touching it it changes i have a plastic one let's try a plastic uh, trimming tool yeah see if this helps us Try get a little bit more on that one. I'll turn this back down again to the minimum. I can't get it closer than that. Let's try the fine adjustment. Well, that's definitely working. Yeah. Uh, that's as fine as I can set it. Really, it's about eight hundred and fifteen rather than nine 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 eight hundred. But that seems to be the, the best I can do. Let's now try yeah the disconnect has got to 31 okay so let's try some capacitors and see what they read and i'll make a note of them so because the way this is working the lowest reading will be the highest esr and the highest reading will be the lowest and then we'll try and get it work the other way so let's just go to our capacitor see just touching it makes a big difference I probably have to use crocodile clip leads actually. Okay, I have some croc clip leads. Let's try it. Try and get a good connection. Okay, so that's really the hundred. Well, you know, it's so sensitive we can't really say. Well, basically, that is just so sensitive. I can't get any sort of reading out of it. I'll go into the milliamps range and see if I can maybe adjust this and get a bit more from it. Let's just disconnect from here. Okay, go to milliamps. It goes into here. I'm now on milliamps, okay? How sensitive can I set this? That is most sensitive. Let's just try altering these adjusters. Let's see if we can get anything reading on the milliamps range. Yeah, I can read milliamps. Okay, I've set it to 14 milliamps. Let's see if it works now. So, that's where the leads open. We need to short the leads. Yeah, no, it doesn't really work. Let's try somewhere in between. It's about 10 milliamps, yeah? Now let's see if it works when we disconnect the leads. Yeah, it's working now. So we've got four. We've got ten okay so that's opening and closing the leads now let's try a capacitor 
this one yeah oh so that means 11.2 yeah 11.2 let's look at this on our ESR meter to get a comparison yeah 10 point yeah it's, we'll call it 11 I think that's close let's look at that on our ESR meter and get a comparison but that looks like a low ESR capacitor it's low ESR 0.0, .0. So connection on it 0.059 let's make a note of that and it's 0.059 and on our meter it was reading 11 yeah let's look at another one I'll do it on the SR meter first so this is a 2200 how does this read Well, that's almost the same, yeah, 0 0.055. Yeah, 0 0.055, it's practically the same. How does that read on our meter? I'm just making note of it. That's the 2200, 0 0.055, how's that read? 11.5. Okay, 11. Four. I think that's the most average there. So that's a lower ESR, and it reads 11.4, which is slightly more. Which is what you'd expect. Let's try a couple of others. So this is, I don't know what it is, it's not a low ESR capacitor. So it's another 2200. And we'll put blue, so we know which one this is, because the one's with green. How's this read? That's very low, yeah, 0 0.024. That's even lower. I'll make a note of it. So this, you'd expect it to read higher if we can read such low resistances, let's see. Yeah, 11.4, 11.5. So it's practically the same. I'll make a note of that one. And then let's try a couple of bad ones. Yeah, we have some bad capacitors here. So this one is quite clearly domed on the top, yeah. Can you see it? Have another one. Yeah, that's even worse probably. So these are bad capacitors. Let's put them on our ESR meter. How does it read? Well that reads 2.05. Yeah. How does that read on our meter? Let's see, yeah, let's see how it reads. Should we lower? Yeah, it's reading 4.7, okay. So that read lower. Make a note of it. 4.7. And then we'll just try another one. Let's put a little mark on it. I don't know which one it is. This is the second bad one. Okay. Put a bit of mark on it. What's this read on our ESR meter? So that's bad as well, 1.66. So it's not as bad as the other one. I'll make a note, 1.66. So this should read a bit higher than the other one, I think. Yeah, that's giving about 10.7. Okay. So, let's have a look at the results. Here we have them. So, this is on my ESR meter. So, this read the lowest and actually read the highest. This was the next one and actually read slightly lower. This was the very low one and it read basically the same as that one. This was the bad one and it reading two, it actually read 4.7. And the one reading 1.66 actually read 10.7. I'm a little bit surprised at that reading. I expected that to be nearer to this. Maybe I just had a bad connection. Let's have another quick look. I've just taken one of the crocodile clip leads off now to make the leads shorter. Oh, yeah. 5.1. So that is much more like what we would expect. 
I think one of these crocodile cut leaves is actually slightly dodgy. Yeah, 5.1. Okay, that's much more like I'd expect. So this is the highest ESR. Gives the lowest reading. Then that one, 5.1. Then this one, 11. 11.4, 11.4, okay. So it definitely works. I mean, it's certainly picking up the low ESR capacitors, but as I expected from the circuit, it's actually reading the high ESR as the lowest reading. So we really want it to work the opposite way round. Now, turn my diagram around. If you think about this, we measure the current flowing through here, okay? The maximum current flows when the voltage here is at its lowest. That might sound strange to you, but this voltage here is 1.5 from the power supply. It doesn't change, okay? If this voltage here is also 1.5, the difference across here is zero, and the current flows is zero, okay? The voltage goes down here to 1.4. We now have 0.1 of a volt across here, and we get a bit of current. If this went down to, say, 1 volt, we'd now have half a volt across here, across this resistance, and we would get more current. So, basically, the lower the voltage here on the collector, the higher the current. Now, the way this works, as we looked before, the higher the resistance of the capacitor, the lower the oscillations, the base voltage here is lower and the collector would be higher so if we measure the voltage across here okay the higher voltage will be the higher esr capacitor let's have a look let's try that to do this we need to disconnect the ammeter and we'll just put a jumper on here okay and then we're going to measure the voltage from ground to the collector. The collector is this 100 ohm resistor here. So let's switch our meter to millivolts. Okay, so what ranges we have. That's 100 millivolts. Oh, let's try the volt range first. Let's just try the volt range. Because we don't know how it's going to work. So this reads down to 100 millivolts. Okay. Yeah, that's volts. Okay, 0, 0.000 volts. So we'll use that range. Now we need to connect our test lead to the volts input. Okay, that's volts. And we need to connect our test meter to the board. So this is the ground lead connected via a crocodile clip. Let's put this onto the easiest place, probably, is the bottom end of this resistor. Okay. Wire out of the way a little bit. So that's the negative. This is the positive of our test meter. And this goes to the collector of the transistor, which is here. I'll just be taking a little bit of care it doesn't connect to the base, which is that link, otherwise, we'll just blow the transistor up. See if we can get it on here. Yeah, it's on there. And I don't think it's going to touch the other one. Okay. We'll start again by shorting our two test leads. Okay. We'll power it up and then let's see what voltage we get on here now. 0.38 of a volt. See if we can adjust that. Lower. Higher. Let's set it to 1 volt. If we can. Okay, just adjust it slightly. We might not get it exactly. This seems actually a little bit easier to set for some reason. We now have as near as damn it one volt. Okay? There, one volt. What happens now if we disconnect these? I'd expect the reading to go up. 
Yeah, up to 1.55. Short them together, back to 1 volt. So let's check our capacitors again. This is the lowest ESR. Let's see if we can uh, do it by just touching the wires on now. It seems a little bit less sensitive now I have it like this. Okay, so this is the lowest ESR. And that reads 1008. I'll make a note of it. These two are almost the same in value. So the next lowest is the uh, 2200. Let's try it. Okay, it does affect a little bit. It seems when I put my fingers on. That's about the same. Let's just try with just one finger on. Yeah, it's basically the same. So I'm expecting this one to read basically the same as well. Yeah, 1008, 1009. Make a note of those. The one that is actually slightly higher just took it up to 1009. Now let's try our bad capacitors. So this is the first one. This is the worst of them. Okay. Try this. One point zero nine, one point zero nine, and the last one not quite so bad. It's here, I put a little mark on it, or to see what I did, put a little mark. So, you'd expect this to be somewhere in between, yeah. Let's have a look. So, negative lead, positive lead. 1.083 okay make a note of that and then we can analyze the results well that actually works if you like better so we got 0 0.008 on that one this also read 0 0.008 0 0.009 those are all the three good ones yeah 0 0.8 0 0.08 so effectively 10 times as much 0 0.09 so the bad ones read 10 times as much effectively as the good ones let's just try this with some one ohm resistors in series and let's try to figure out how linear this is so this is a one ohm resistor okay let's try it That reads 1.057. Now let's get two resistors together and we'll try two ohms. Obviously I haven't checked the, how close these are, but they're 1% resistors, so they're probably fairly close. That's two ohms, yeah. What have we got? One point zero nine one. 1.090 okay uh, let's go for five ohms okay so we'll, we'll twist five of these together well actually now I've done that we can actually measure with three four and five as well yeah so let's just do it so we go one end so this is three ohms 1.122 go four ohms 1.166 one six six and we'll go five ohms which is a whole lot one point one eight seven that's all five then let's try say a ten a twenty two or thirty three let's see how far we can go okay here is a ten ohm resistor brown black black try it 1.314 and then let's go for 22 is probably the next standard value I have okay here's a 22 
red, red block. One point five two. That is almost at the top of the range, I think. One point five one nine. I think that's probably almost as far as we can go with this. So we have a range of values, yeah. Now, we can kind of work out from this. If we look at the difference between each two from here to here, and then from two to three, and from three to four, we can see whether it's in a linear fashion, do we get the same amount of difference for every ohm we change? Let's have a look. Okay, let's have a look. Instead of putting the whole value in, I can just put this three-digit number in. That's all I really need because that's the difference, yeah? And what I want to see is, is the difference for each ohm the same. So we've got 90 minus 57, yeah? 90 minus 57. The difference is 33, yeah? 0 0.033, okay? If you want Right, so does the next ohm give us basically the same difference? Let's have a look. So, clear that. Uh, 122 two minus 90. It's going to be very close, isn't it? 32. Uh, 0 0.032. Let's go for the next ohm. In fact, I've actually put them in the wrong place. doesn't matter. Next one is 66 minus, well, we can kind of work this out. We don't need the calculator. Yeah, four, four. So the next change gives us about 0 0.044. The next one actually gave us 0 0.02. 0 0.020. 0. So that takes us up to five ohms. Yeah, five ohms. Now we went from 5 to 10, so you can see it isn't linear, it's, it's, it's kind of a bit over the place, it's possible some of these resistors are not reading right or we have some slightly bad connections. We'd have to do some proper study of this, but this gives us an idea. So I then went up 5 ohms, yeah, so to work this one out quite easy, and you know I don't like maths on the channel, but we need to do this. So 314 minus... Uh, 186 uh, and then divide that by 5 the answer so that's 128 divided by 5 oops I put 3 5 uh, what is 25.6 0.025 0.26 we'll round it up so that one is in kind of like the region of these yeah uh, Let's get the last one. So I went up there, I went up another 12 ohms, okay? So we want to go now from 519 minus uh, 314 equals 205 divided by 12 ohms, yeah? So divided by 12 ohms gives us about 17 ohm. Uh, 0.017 so there we have it apart from this stray reading here it appears that basically as you go up in resistance the difference per ohm becomes a bit less yeah it's something a bit like that okay so what can we do with this well the first thing we have proved is that we can definitely find the difference between bad and good capacitors. Yeah, definitely see the difference between a low ESR capacitor and a bad one. So it works. Yeah, it works. Considering this thing, you could probably put together from salvage parts pretty much. These transistors are not critical. I would suggest any... NPN transistor, you can look up the data sheet for this, but any NPN transistor, small signal transistor that has a gain of 300 or so, should be quite sufficient for this circuit, yeah. 
these diodes are not critical, the protection devices and everything else. Three capacitors, these resistors are just things lying around, I would think. Probably the only thing you might need to buy is a coil. But I would suggest that if you can salvage some parts, you could build this thing for a dollar. Uh, and you'd probably spend that on the coil. Everything else you could find. If you had to buy the transistors and the trimmer pots, you're going to spend less than $5 if you bought all the components, I would think. Okay? So we can call this the $1 ESR meter. That is sure. And it works. You'd have to measure some resistors like I was doing. And then you can compare the readings to some capacitors and you can kind of figure out what it's giving you. I mean, it sort of makes sense because the two ohms here, 1.090, was reading the same as the capacitor bad, which had 2.05 ohms ESR, yeah, using the ESR meter. So we know it works. There is your $1 ESR meter. How can we improve it? Well, we're basically measuring the voltage. The output is here. And ground. Yeah, that's where we're measuring. Now, we could connect this. And I've drawn it wrong straight away. Okay. We can put an op amp in here. And we don't connect that to ground like that at all. Two inputs, yeah, non inverting, inverting. If you connect from here and not to ground, yeah, if you connect from here, resistor, resistor, yeah, and we'll put trimmer pot one side or the other, yeah, and you set the voltage on here to equal the voltage on here when the leads are shorted. Yeah, you'll zero it. So basically, we know when the leads are shorted, we have about one volt on here. Yeah, and that is set with this trimmer pot. So with this trimmer pot, we can set this to also be one volt. If you do that, coming out of your op amp will be zero. Okay, and you've now got rid of the one, and all you're left with, I shouldn't have drawn it upside down, is these numbers. Okay. Now we know that 57, 057 is 1 ohm. So we could then, possibly using the same op amp, I'm not very expert on them, but I think with the resistor here, you can set the gain. So we could multiply that 0 0.06 basically by enough gain to make it read 1. Yeah. I can work out what the gain is even. Let's just do it, yeah. Let's do a bit of designing today. Why not? Although I'm not a designer, yeah. Let's just do it. So 1 divided by 0 0.057 yeah, is 17.54. So that's rough. That's basically the gain we need on our amplifier. And basically, then, when you have point. 0, 0.057 on here with a 1 ohm resistor this will give you 1 volt 1 volt is 1 ohm we set our meter to volts range yeah 1.000 you can now measure ohms and you can measure them down to a thousandth of an ohm ESR okay so we could do that yeah this amplifier might need dual power rails I'm not sure but I'm sure some of you guys will know and we need more voltage. But I don't see why we couldn't run this from two PP3 batteries, plus and minus nine pair of batteries. And we may be able to run this circuit at a higher voltage as well. Yeah, we may not have to use such a low voltage. The only limitation to that, I would think, is to you may have to increase the value of this resistor for the higher voltage. But then I think you would get a bigger difference per ohm as well. Yeah, so... By adding something like that onto it and a couple of P3 batteries, I think we could make an ESR meter that reads in ohms, and you probably have still spent less than $5. Okay, so that's the end of that for today, end of part one. I'm absolutely sure I'm going to have plenty of people in the comments below 
discussing this. Get all your best ideas in. I will try it. And let's see in part two, can we make this read in ohms with an accuracy of a thousandth of an ohm, a milliohm, and I think we can. And then we have a fantastic ESR meter for five dollars. Okay, guys, I'll see you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. And we might even fix stuff on the next one, okay? <laughs> so, ciao for now.